Views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the staff or management of KLAV. Welcome to Aspects of Writing with your host, James Kelly. For the next 60 minutes, we'll explore every aspect of writing, including how to create, format, and even sell your work. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230. Or toll free, 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing. This is your host, James Kelly. On the show this evening, we have Morgan St. James, who's the author of The Mafia Funeral, The Silver Sisters Mysteries, and Writer's Tricks of the Trade. We also have Oksana Marfati. Is that correct, Oksana? Marfiotti. Uh, uh, Marfiotti. <laughs> um, she's the author of American Gypsy, a memoir um, of a, a Romanian gypsy childhood. Romani gypsy <laughs> childhood. That's all right, James. <laughs> what a way to start the show. <laughs> and then we also have on the show via telephone um, Australian author Anthony Koraki. Um, he'll be joining us here in a few minutes. Um, the topic of tonight's show is publishers versus self-publishing. Uh, should you find a publisher or self-publish? Uh, can anyone publish? Uh, we will debate the vanity and subsidiary publishers, as well as print-on-demand and e-books. Uh, I always like to start with fun facts or fun quotes, so we're going to start off with um, a quote by Brian Stableford. Uh, Morgan, would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure. I'll take that one, J James. <laughs> uh, Brian Stableford wrote, People are always impressed by the creative power of a writer. But an author's image can easily be demolished or made humble with a few well-chosen questions. For instance, Bob Shaw observed that the deadliest questions usually come as a pair. Have you published anything? Loosely translated as, I've never heard of you. <laughs> and what name do you write under? Loosely translatable as, I've definitely never heard of you. <laughs> And that is so true. You had a story you told me earlier about oh, what yeah. happened with you. When, so. when, I, when I was a young pup in a different life, um, I was working for a theatrical business manager, and there was a cafeteria next door where all of the Hollywood greats would come um, on South Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. And the owner always used to like to introduce me to different stars that were in there. And one day she introduced me to somebody named Keith, and she said, uh, he doesn't have anybody to have breakfast with. Keith, why don't you have breakfast with this young lady? <laughs> and so we started talking, and uh, she had said, Keith is an actor. And I said, well, I understand that you're in the business, that you're an actor. Are you doing anything right now? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah. He said, I just starred in a little thing called the Eddie Cantor story. <laughs> and it was a, an actor named Keith Brazil who was quite popular at the time. And I had egg on my face. <laughs> So loosely translated, I've never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> Problem was, I had heard of him. <laughs> I just didn't recognize him. And we have a quote number two. Oksana, would you like to take that one? Sure. In 1990, after selling his bookstop, bookstore chain to Barnes & Noble for $45 million, Gary Hoover founded Reference Press, renamed later as Hoover's Incorporated. As a reference book publisher, beginning with a book called Hoover's, in 1995, the company went online with the launch of Hoover's Online. In December 2002, he sold Hoover's Inc. to Dunn and Bradstreet for $117 million. What's interesting about that to me is the fact that he was in the bookstore business, saw the chance to, to basically let the big chain take over because they would have put him out of business anyway, and then had the sense to know that when he went online, I can score with this as well. So he made it in both online <laughs> bookstore as well as a chain Very bookstore. Smart. Absolutely. And Anthony, are you there? I'm here. How are you going? Oh, great. So how would you like to read number three, Anthony? And Anthony is actually calling in from Melbourne, Australia. Very far away. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few miles, huh? And it's tomorrow. <laughs> and it's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm in the future. <laughs> <laughs> He's a future okay, guest. Yeah, I'll read number three for you. <laughs> All right. Okay. English writer G.K. Chesterton once said, I owe my success to having listened respectfully to the very best advice and then going away and doing the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds I, like a plan. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And if, if if you're wondering how he knew how to read that, it's because he's in the future. <laughs> <I am>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, number four is Ralph Waldo Emerson is quoted as, as having said, talent alone cannot make a writer. There must be a man behind the book. And I, I have to say that I'm actually a distant relative of <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson on my grandmother's <laughs> side. He's like a great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> um, if you're just now tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, right here on KLAV, Las Vegas. Uh, before we get into the topic of tonight's show's publishers versus self-publishing, I'd like to introduce my guests and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. And when they finish, I have a few questions for them. Uh, Morgan, would you like, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I always say that I'm an accidental writer because I didn't start out to be one. I was an interior designer and was asked to write an article for a very prestigious design magazine. And uh, my partner and I said, yeah, sure, we'll do that. The deadline was approaching, and there was one thing we'd forgotten. We weren't writers. (laughs) And so the night before, we were agonizing, drinking some wine and so forth. And instead of writing a technical article about um, creating a unique floor, we wrote a noir mystery with us combing the waterfront for crates. Publisher loved it, and I was a writer. I was hooked. Um, I wrote magazine articles for several years, and then I started writing... um, Novels started out with the Silver Sisters mystery, A Corpse in the Soup, which was the first one in the series. And that's with your sister, is that correct? And that's with my sister. She was living in Juneau, Alaska at the time. She now lives in Manville, Oregon. So we write long distance. There are three books in the series now, um, Corpse in the Soup, Seven Deadly Samovars, and Vanishing Act in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we are currently working on Diamonds in the Dumpster. Um, (laughs) I also write on my own. I have um, a new book coming out in July from Oak Tree Press called Who's Got the Money, which is a government embezzlement fiasco. And I have um, The Mafia Funeral and other short stories, which was released recently. My book on writing is Writer's Tricks of the Trade. And I'm probably going to take up too much time if I tell you much more about myself, so I should probably turn this over. People get tired (laughs) listening to it. (laughs) Well, we'll have some of your credentials on my (laughs) website as well, so we'll tell them about that before we leave tonight. Um, Oksana, would you like to tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, Yes, I am Oksana Marafiotti, and I'm the author of a memoir called American Gypsy. And it is about my experience growing up in a gypsy family. Okay. Um, Romani is the proper term. <laughs> <laughs> that was very I know that slick. Now. <laughs> <laughs> very slick. Um, and, um, well, I'm quite used to this, so, you know. <laughs> and um, it's about my experience growing, about w- growing up in the former Soviet Union mm-hmm. um, in, the, in the family of very well-known musicians and artists and about moving to United States actually to Hollywood, and it's the book is just about that experience. Well, I noticed that your book was also published by Macmillan's. It's actually published by Macmillan's uh, imprint, Farrar, uh, Strauss, and Giroux, FSG. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Anthony, are you there? Yeah, I'm still um, here. Uh, <laughs> how about if you tell us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> uh, well, I wrote a book called Vagabond, which... It's like a philosophical travel adventure, basically, centering on the pursuit of happiness. Um, Behind that, the main inspiration for it was basically I've been traveling probably since I turned 17, 18, nonstop, and all the wonderful things I had a chance to see and experience, I just really want to tie it into one book and try and share those experiences. Um, It's actually born and raised and still living in Melbourne, Australia, and I grew up playing the drums since the age of seven. My family's very musical, so I've definitely inherited that trait and that passion for music. And yeah, I started writing when I was 18, um, some songs, just some random articles for different publications, and it eventuated into the book Vagabond. And we're going to go into it a little bit later, but I know that you also, your characters in the book, people were writing you about the jewelry that they were wearing, or the artifacts that you described, and you're actually going to be producing a line of jewelry based on that novel as well, I believe. Is that correct? Ah, yes, I am. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fully customizable, so they can choose to have it in its original state. For example, there's a wooden cross that appears quite prominently in the book, uh, but they can also choose to have it in gold or silver or whatever they like, so it's, it can be personalized for them. 
Well, I'm going to start a roundtable discussion here, and basically, I usually ask specific questions, and you know, because I, I want to inspire our audience out there that are write or want to be writers, or even for those that have written and want to get published. So, my first question, I'm going to start off with Oksana. Oksana, what ex- inspired you to write your first novel? My first novel was inspired by my experiences growing up in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from a background of um, people who are very interested in mysticism and spirituality. My grand- grandparents were very, very much into um, the occult, I guess, but not in the in the dark sense right. of it. You know, not the evil <laughs> the, side the of the occult, old folk art type <laughs> of um, spirituality, mystic, right. <laughs> old country type. And uh, so my original idea for a novel was to base characters on these people from my family and kind of create these experiences and adventures. Um, but I actually ended up writing a memoir. Mm. And that was that came about because a, an agent that I met that I was pitching to, I was pitching the novel, said, mm-hmm. well, why don't you just write the, the real thing? <laughs> you know, my father was an exorcist, for, an exorcist for many years. And she said, well, that's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just do that. It's right there. You don't have to make up characters. So your agent guided you. She kind of did. Yeah. yeah. And it was kind of uh, daunting for me because most people don't want to write memoirs. Right. Um, it's just it's 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 a very scary feeling. Well, you feeling have to put you yourself begin. into it, and you really disclose a lot about who you are and the family. Yeah, especially the others. <laughs> the others, right. they're the ones who don't like it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and you 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 gave us a little bit of an idea what inspired you. Yeah. Oh well, actually, that was what inspired me to get into magazine writing. Mm-hmm. Getting into novel writing was a whole different story. Um, my sister and I both had publication credits, but not in fiction. Mm-hmm. And we really didn't know each other very well. She moved to Alaska when she was 20, and I'm five and a half years older. So right about the time we would have been friends, she was thousands of miles away, and my mom was the conduit who told each of us what was happening. Mom got sick. Phyllis came to L.A. to help me get her settled. And as we talked and got to know each other, we realized that we liked a lot of the same things. And... The binding thing was that we both loved funny mysteries, and there we were, both published writers. So about a week later, I sent her uh, a message. No, there was no email then. I I called her, and I said, uh, what would you think about creating our own mystery series? I kind of had this idea about an over-the-hill hippie who lives in Juneau, Alaska, and runs an antique shop, and um, her twin sister, who is a Beverly Hills widow, who writes an advice column, and she's very selfish and manipulative. She said, that sounds like you, Morgan. And I said, well, <laughs> you're the hippie. And she <laughs> you know? lives in Juno. And, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so we created the identical twins, the Silver Sisters, And um, we loosely modeled them on ourselves. Actually, Goldie is pure Phyllis, but I always have to qualify it and say that Godiva is much more selfish than I am. (laughs) Um, I didn't live in Beverly Hills, but at one time I did live two houses outside of Beverly Hills. If you cross the street, (laughs) it was Beverly Hills. And I'm not an advice columnist, but people are always asking me for advice. So the Silver Sisters were born, and now we are working on the fourth book in the series. Incidentally, A Corpse in the Soup, the first book, was named the best mystery audio book of 2000, best, yeah, best mystery audio book of 2007 by USA Book News. So we kind of did what we set out to do. Oh, that's perfect. Anthony, um, what inspired you to write your novel? Uh, my main inspiration definitely came from my love for travel. Uh, being in Australia, it's so far away from everywhere else, so when people do try and work up the the capital to go travelling, they usually go for quite a long time. So when I first turned 18, I went for five weeks across England, Spain, and Greece, and it really it set off the travel bug like something bad. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, ever since then, I've just been travelling a lot, a lot to Europe, all around, and it was just, I guess, being inspired by the people I'd come across, meeting people from all walks of life, different ages, all all there for their own reason, expats, um, doing a lot of reading while I was traveling. And I just guess I felt like I wanted to give something back to all the books that inspired me to love reading since I was little. And I just wanted to try and convey the experiences that I had, the great moments that I shared with different people through the book Vagabond. So those that are thinking about traveling or 
want to get away for whatever reason. I, I was just hoping to give them something to give them a, a bit more of a push to go and do that. Well, just to clarify, Vagabond, it, it is not a, is it a true novel or is it a fiction? It's fiction. But it's, it's based on it's, your travels, though, right? Based on my travels. It's yeah. got elements of magical realism, definitely, going for that Latin American style, but it is a fiction book. And why did you decide to self-publish? I decided to self-publish because I was just looking at how the industry was going. Um, I mean, you've always got the paperbacks, of course, but then the whole new e-book technology started to really take off. And I was just having a look at all, all different avenues using social media, and I thought, I'll try and give this a shot myself. And, you know, at the time when I was sending off a few query letters to agents, I wasn't having any luck, really. Um, you know, you, everyone comes across the rejections or, you know, sometimes some people don't even bother to write back, which is a little bit disheartening. But yeah, exactly. I thought, well, if I'm going to have such a hard time going that route, I'll just do it myself and see how it goes. And, you know, lucky for me, it went on to become a bestseller. So that's, yeah, it's the route I decided to go. Um, funnily enough, though, learning how to do the formatting of the book, it, that probably took double the amount of time of me actually writing it. <laughs> It's yeah. quite a process to learn. It's I, I think HTML programming. And that's, I think, the, the misnomer people have. They think that you know writing the book is easy. I mean, it's hard, but actually writing the book is the easy part. It's the formatting of it, getting it ready for production, and getting it produced. That's the, that's the work part and of it. And promoting it. And promoting it. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely felt, looking back on it, that writing the book and editing and proofreading... I felt that was maybe 30% of the effort. <laughs> so yeah. originally I came into it a little bit naive, thinking that would be 90% of the work done, but it was kind of like a drop in the pond compared to everything <laughs> else you have to do. Well, I know Morgan is also self-published, but you've, you've, had, you've had a traditional publishers, plus you've also self-published. Yeah, well, I actually determine which is the best for the particular book. Most of my books are published by traditional publishers, and um, when I did Writer's Tricks of the Trade, it was a book that I needed right away because I give a lot of talks, and people would always ask, well, where can I get your writing book? And I didn't have one. I've written 500 published articles on writing, and I would direct them to examiner.com, but I didn't have a book. And I realized that I had enough material for three books. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I decided that because I needed to get it right away, and it was going to be what they call a back-of-the-house book mostly, which is when you give a talk and people want to buy your book afterwards for instruction. So uh, not necessarily for instruction, but a lot of the back-of-the-house books are that. And so I decided my best way to do it would be to self-publish it. But I set up my own publication company, to do that, and um, it's professionally edited, professional cover, professionally formatted. I mean, it, it's, I strove to have the exact same type of product I would get from a traditional publisher, mm -hmm. and it's distributed throughout the world by the same distributors that right. traditional publishers right. use. Now, Oksana, I know yours is through a major publishing house. Yes. Did you ever toy with the idea of self-publishing, or mm, because you no. spoke with an agent, so yours was... Yes, I actually I didn't really think about publishing when I went in to that that first writers conference. It was the Las Vegas Writers Conference, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think about four or five years ago. I just went in out of curiosity, just to see how the industry works. Um, I don't think you can pick one or the other without knowing enough about the industry as a whole, and that's what I wanted to do: is just to go and talk to agents, to go to talk to authors and other people to see what stages people are in in their projects. And as for myself, I actually self-published my first book because I, I never had the intentions of ever having a bestseller or anything like that as a, with the book. My intention was to sell the script because I actually wrote the script first. I thought, well, if I create the book and I publish it, I was toying with the idea of getting an agent, and then, then I actually saw Dan Pointer's book on how to self-publish in a Kinko's in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I was living at the time. And then I thought, well, I can do this. And so I actually quit my job and spent a year working on that project. So I'm kind of like Anthony in a way. I just thought, well, I don't really want to toy around with this. I'll just do it myself. 
Yeah, well, Dan Pointer is somebody who can inspire you to self-publish. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and that was one of his first books out there, by the way, at the time. Because really? that was 1990, I think yeah, it was. He's got a gazillion so. of them now. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like the godfather of self-publishing. Right, the guru of <laughs> self-publishing. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then I'm going to ask Asana, what advice would you give an up-and-coming writer, author, uh, trying to break into the business? And I know you're new, and I, you know, I know you're new at this, and I know yours was a different route at which you went in. It was very untraditional, it seems mm -hmm. like, from all the other experiences that I hear about. Um, the only advice I can give is that to try it. A lot of people don't even try it. But at, at least you, you, you did something. You actually went to a conference. Yes. So you at least made that effort. I was very open to, to all the possibilities. You know, I would never think about writing a memoir on my own, I think, because it was... Okay. And what about you, Morgan? Well, I would say that you have to learn your craft. Go to workshops. Go to conferences. Take the things that work for you and be sure that whatever you do, it's the very best you can possibly do. And the other thing is don't lose faith. Just right. keep at it. And... You'll be amazed um, if you look at things you wrote, say, three, four, five years ago after you've been writing, you'll look at them and say, oh, my God, I've grown. Right. I, I know that's the way I am as well. And actually, can I add something real quick? Sure. Absolutely. And I think Anthony will agree with me if he has a mu musical background. I'm a, I'm a classically trained pianist myself. and. Oh, from well. the, from the that's a good thing, right? <laughs> <I hope>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, from if you're looking at it at, from a from a point of view of a musician, you cannot be become good at something without hours and hours of practice. And I think a lot of people who are who go into writing, they assume because you know we write since we're four or five, that we should know how to do it. And it takes a very long time to get to the point. You have to keep writing to find out what kind of a writer you are. I, I agree and I disagree, and I'm going to tell you why. There's a friend of mine in Atlanta, Georgia, who published um, two books. One was Sudi and the other one was Alice. Both were made into Lifetime movies. And her writing was absolutely horrible. But she was fortunate enough to have a friend who also was a romance uh, author, and she read it, and it was very difficult for her to get through, but she said, these are great stories. So they found an editor, and, and they, they polished it and send it in. They were both published and they were both made into movies. So I think the desire, as long as the desire is there, there are ways to get your work out there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting for everyone to do that. I really do think you're right. I know I hone my skills every day as well. You know, every time I write something, I get better and better and better. But I don't want to discourage anyone from the idea of that you're not, you don't have a chance if you're just starting this because that isn't necessarily true. Well, that's yeah, not what I'm saying at all. It's just uh, you need to practice it all the time instead right. of saying, yes. well, yeah. I'm going to wait and see if somebody will, will take my story, and then I'll start writing. You know, the, right, right. The right, work right. has to come before, I think. Right, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. You definitely have to get it written <laughs> yeah. first. I, I agree with that, too. I mean, I have six novels in publication now, and I can look back at some of the early things and think, I would have done that a little differently, you know, if I knew then what I know now. now yeah, Not yeah. to say it's a bad book because it was named Best <laughs> Mystery Audio Book, but there were certain things I would have changed. Um, I'd like to add one more thing, too, if sure, we absolutely. have a minute, is that um, don't be defensive. You know, if you belong to a critique group, understand that for the most part, those people are trying to help, help you, you. Yeah. not to put you down. Um, just a quick example, we had a fellow in a critique group that I belong to in Los Angeles, and he had a very long introduction. He was an unpublished author. He had a very long introduction, like 25-page introduction. And I said, you know, you've actually got to break that a little bit. And he said, well, I don't care if anybody likes it. I like it. <laughs> and that's not going to get him no, published. No, 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 no. <laughs> but because writers have egos, let's just be honest here. We hate hearing anything negative. I mean, it's good for us. I mean, I, I actually like it when someone tells me something because I actually listen oh, to them too. and I usually make changes um, unless I've just determined they're wrong. But anyway, uh, <laughs> 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 we do have a caller online. Um, Judy McFadden is online. Oh. <laughs> Judy, are you there? Yes, James. How are you? <laughs> Great. How are you? <laughs> and Morgan and Oksana. Hey, how Judy. Are you guys? I mean, we, we have... Uh, uh, met not too long ago. And like two days ago. <laughs> like two days ago, and uh, you guys were giving great advice. I mean, I know the listeners out there uh, are just really getting a good chunk of advice. However, my question is for Anthony. Okay. <laughs> yes? <laughs> I um, wrote a book, Anthony, 
about a, a Scottish Terrier therapy dog. And soon after it was published, it just it, Australia just ate it up. It's in I can't tell you how many uh, online bookstores in Australia. Borders in Australia, after it was out, it was number one of the top five pet and domestic animal books. It's in the libraries at Brisbane, Newcastle, Melbourne, State Library of Western Australia, and it's on the uh, Internet, uh, the, the website for the National Library of Australia. I didn't realize that, it, it, is there an attraction for dogs in Australia? <laughs> I think um, all of Australia like, such an abundance of wildlife. I think that it's, they love everything, really. <laughs> um, yeah, dog, like everyone down here is really an animal lover. I guess nature in the Australian environment is such a big part of growing up. I mean, going overseas, you know, it didn't really cross my mind, but people started to say, oh, you know, there's so many dangerous animals in Australia, and you'd, you'd tell them a story about a wombat or a shark or something. <laughs> it, I think coming from Australia, it doesn't register that that's a sort of, you know, a unique, a unique thing to a lot of people. But down under, everyone's really an animal lover, dogs, cats, the works. So, yeah, I mean, congratulations I, on your success. That's amazing. Okay, well, I, I didn't realize that at, at the time, and, I, and they're just, I mean, that, that just surprised me, and especially the libraries, too, you know. So, okay, yeah. well, then I thought it was just the dingoes running around there. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, quite a, quite a few interesting animals down under, if you ever have the chance to come down. <laughs> Oh, yes. I, I did. Yeah, Morgan. Morgan <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're, Morgan, your son lives in yeah, Blue uh, Mountain. Uh, around Katoomba up in the Blue Mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a very nice area. Yeah, okay. I was there in I'm September. Gonna get off. I'm, you guys have a lot more in advice. And James, <laughs> yes. take care. <laughs> All right, thank you, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Now, Anthony, what advice would you give to an up-and-coming writer or author? Uh, similar to what Morgan was saying, just you've got to keep the faith and the passion in yourself. Um, mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, you really can't rely on anyone but yourself to get the job done, do what it is that you need to do. Um, just, yeah, do the best you can to get it out there. Treat the internet as your best friend, social media. It's it's really amazing the people that you can reach using social media. And, yeah, just you know, stick to your guns and accept constructive criticism. Um, know as well that a lot of things are subjective. And just, you know, keep trying and keep trying, and eventually you, you could be fortunate enough to get some recognition. I, when I first published my book, I thought, well, you know, I'm from Australia, so I guess it's just going to be Australians buying it. And I've noticed the last couple of weeks the American audience on Facebook and my website has eclipsed that by quite a bit, and then I'm getting people from France and Saudi Arabia writing to me about the book and you just, the internet is just amazing that way you just never know where the book's going to end up and how it can inspire people and the fans you can find across the world is just amazing Yes. Um, where can people learn more about your book? Uh, they can go to my website which is anthonycarakai.com I've got a strange unique surname so to spell that it's K-A-R-A-K-A-I so you go to anthonycarakai.com they can go to facebook.com slash books. And, yeah, I welcome everyone to join me on Facebook, get into a discussion, just drop by, say hi, anything. I just love talking to everyone. And, Oksana, when will your book be out? Uh, it comes out July 3rd and, of this year. Okay. We, and you'll have to give us more information when it comes out. On, or do you know already where they can? It's on Amazon. It's, it's, on it's Amazon. everywhere. It's oh. available to pre-order right now, but it's going to be in all the major bookstores. Oh, and great. I have an author's page on Facebook. Oh, great. Okay. Meanwhile, just posting some of the... Uh, events that I'm in involved in right now. All right. And Morgan? Well, you can find me at my website, www.morgansaintjames, that's S-T-J-A-M-E-S, dash author dot com. My books are in just about every online bookstore you can imagine. Um, you can order them from your local bookstores. And I'm on Facebook. If you put my name into Google, you'll get a lot of pages. Okay. Um, just for anyone tuning in, I'd like to remind you you're listening to Aspects of Writing here on KLAV, and I'm your host, James Kelly. Okay, let's talk a, l- a little bit about the topic of the show tonight, which is publishers versus self-publishing. We've, we've hinted on that a little bit already. Um, I'm going to read our first quote from the Internet. Um, just 
Yeah, here's a few facts for that. After graduating from college in 1980, Michael Prescott had labored for almost three decades to become a best-selling novelist, writing more than 20 books under various names. He enjoyed um, critical praise and some successes. But when 25 publishers passed on buying his thriller Riptide, now keep in mind he'd already been a published author, Michael Prescott thought maybe his career as a writer was over. Then on a whim, he decided to self-publish Riptide as an e-book, selling more than 800,000 copies. Since then, five of Prescott's sales have been logged um, a to- have logged a total of 42 weeks on USA Today's bestseller list. Due his- to his newfound celebrity, his 1992 book Shiver was made into a 2011 movie. One reason Prescott is able to capitalize on the ebook revolution is that he already has a back uh, list of novels previously edited and released by traditional pub- publishers. Once his publisher let his past books go out of print, this is important. The rights reverted back to Prescott. So in other words, now he had the rights to take those books and do whatever he wanted, and he was smart. Prescott is quoted as as having said, it's a whole new world. You're eliminating the middleman. And he's talking about the Internet book. Um, Anthony, I know that you're doing very well with your e-books as well. Is that correct? Uh, Yes. I'm, yeah, selling steadily in a whole host of countries, which is great. Um, selling books in places I just never imagined I would. Um, for example, Tanzania, which was an interesting little standout. I wasn't even ever thinking that someone from Tanzania would be reading Vagabond. Uh, I've just been, yeah, just trying to market things myself. Um, being self-published, it can be difficult. You're just trying to wear so many hats. You're trying to be the writer, the proofreader, the editor, the marketer. It's It can be difficult, but fortunate for me, um, I was discovered by a really good New York City literary agent who I'm currently working with. Yes, so and congratulations. Alleviate, yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, it's definitely going to alleviate a lot of the pressure, and um, I guess you know he's he's got the required expertise and knowledge, which I don't have, so it definitely helps me out a lot. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm just writing my second book, which is titled The End of Athens. All right, great. Morgan, um, you want to read number two? Yeah, I will, and I hope I'm going to pronounce this name correctly. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is a problem here. Yes, um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barbara Freethy has been a top-selling romance author for the past 20 years, who has written 30 novels. She has sold 1.3 million self-published ebook versions of 17 of her out-of-print novels. There again, the out-of-print. Yes, yes, because the rights reverted to Back her. Back to her. So they've already been edited by the publisher. They've already they been out there the on the market. They've done. They're ready to go. And now they have a new life as an ebook. Yep. Uh, nine of them hit USA Today's Top 150. She's quoted as having said there have been more changes in the last two years than in the previous 18 years I have been in publishing. She is now considering self-publishing her new book, A Secret Wish. She finds it satisfying to see the shift of power within the publishing industry. Authors are gaining more control over their work than ever before. And, you know, that is really a true comment. Um, publishing is nothing like it was a couple of years ago. Just in the few short years since, <clears throat> excuse me, my first book was published, it's changed radically. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what's interesting? I, I originally started publishing in 1995. And in, in the span of all those years, it's amazing how the bookstores don't welcome self-published authors anymore. Actually, at that time, it was the heyday of, of self-publishing to get your book in a store. It was very easy. You would just go to the events coordinators. You would show them the book. They would critique it. If they liked it, you, you, you got a book signing. And then from there, it could just take off. Today, you can't. It's very difficult no. to just go into a store and say, you know, I have, I'm a local author. I have a book. I'd like to present it to you. Can I do a book signing? Nope. You have to go through the main office in New York. And then there's so much, you know, criteria you have to go through to hey, get Listen, that. When, when you live in a city like L.A. and you, people say, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm an author. And they look at you and raise an eyebrow and say, oh, you too? <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody's an author. <laughs> Anthony, would you like to take the next one? Sure thing. Uh, attorney and debut novelist Darcy Chan self-published her debut novel, The Mill River Recluse, after being rejected by more than 100 literary agents. Set in a small Vermont town, the moody mystery centers on what happened to a beautiful young bride. It spent 16 weeks on USA Today's bestseller list, peaking at number six. 
Chan said she told she sold four hundred and sixteen thousand copies of the ninety nine cent ebook. Right. So, you know, it, it's it's amazing how just it's it's like Barbara um, Freethy said. It, you know, in the last two years, it's amazing how ebooks have just taken off. I mean, they're almost dominating the industry. Amazon is very smart. Amazon, actually, all of them are becoming very smart about picking up on that. But Amazon really helps you get your book out there on ebooks. You yeah. Know? Well, they have that Amazon Select program mm-hmm. now, which is a good marketing tool. I actually put. Um, the Mafia Funeral and other short stories into it and um, saw a real surge in the sales after the days when the book was free. Yeah. Um, Oksana, would you like to take number four? Sure. Amanda Hawking, 27, a lifelong Minnesotan from a working class background, has been telling stories almost since she could climb out of the crib. And she has been writing full-fledged novels since the age of 17. Unable to find an agent, she began self-publishing her young adult paranormal romances in 2010. They became huge hits. Seven of them have spent 50 weeks on USA Today's last year. She has sold over 1.5 million copies of her work on her own. There was not a single book agent or publishing house or sales force or marketing manager or bookshop anywhere in sight. I, I think we last show... Judy not only was on the, the last show, but also um, Don Lewis Barnhart was on the show. And even with Don's credentials, because he, he was a big-time Hollywood director, um, he still could not find someone to take his books. And s- here, here's an example of someone who said, you know what? I don't need this. I don't need the rejections. I'm going to do it myself. And he went out there, and he self-published four books. So that just gives you an idea of... I think the bookstores are making a mistake today by not doing their events like they used to, by not having you know, the opportunity for uh, at least try an author and see how well they're going to sell in the right, stores. Right, exactly. Even when you go in and say you're a local author, and when you're published by a small press, which the traditional presses I'm with are small presses, Correct, yeah. um, they still kind of raise an eyebrow. You know, my books have been approved for Barnes & Noble and stuff like that, but... Uh, The majority of my sales come from the Internet. Anthony, what is, in Australia, what is the mood like there as far as getting your books in the store? Uh, Well, a lot of stores in Australia, um, a lot of bookstores like Borders, um, a lot of them have shut down, actually. I don't know if that's directly attributable to the e-book revolution, but a lot of them are, you know, it's hard to kind of find those big major retailers these days. In terms of e-books... Uh, from what I understand, it's it's not at the level of the USA or the UK or Europe with um, the Kindle and the iBook store. It's they're still catching on down here, but it's it's going pretty well. I mean, with the retailers shutting down, I guess that is indicative of the shift in power in a way. Uh, but I mean, yeah, every day eBooks are growing and growing. It's not quite that American level yet, though. Right. Well, I'm going to um, go into a little bit here about what our our, our topic is tonight, um, which is publishers versus self-publishing. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of what I got off the Internet. Um, today, authors such as Prescott and Hawking can bypass traditional publishers. They can digitally format their own manuscript, set a price, and sell it to readers through a variety of online retailers and devices. Amazon sells ebooks via Kindle, a Kindle device, and it is a Kindle app for smartphones and computers as well. Apple has done the same thing. Apple has now Apple i iBook. Is that what it's called? I, Apple Author, which you yeah. can create your book and then upload it to iTunes, I believe. Um, almost every day brings more digital modes for readers to obtain books in non-print forms, creating more choices for readers, opportunities for self-published writers, and challenges for traditional publishers. You know, there was a time when the big stores put the small mom-and-pop bookstores out of business. And interestingly enough... Unless these bigger chains, which they are, they're, they're revamping the way they sell as well, you know, you're going to see the traditional bookstore go to the wayside. You know, um, you may end up seeing more mom, mom and pop bookstores pop up as they disappear. Because even here, Anthony, in the United States, Borders has also closed doors. Okay. So I guess that's a worldwide. Yeah, well, you yeah. yeah. Um, as, as you were saying with the mom and pop stores, down here, there's definitely a a unique sort of, I guess, a sort of nostalgic niche 
across Australia with those little independent mm-hmm. retailers um, selling everything from second-hand books to hard-to-find books. I mean, a lot of the times when I'd go to Borders, I'd be looking for a particular book, and amazingly enough, they wouldn't actually stock it, but I could go to a, a small independent retailer and they'd have those those little books that you know might not have had a lot of coverage or a lot of marketing put behind them, but those retailers definitely did well, and they still continue to do so. You know what's interesting? There was actually a movie about how the small stores <laughs> went out of business. I don't know if you saw that movie with Meg Ryan or not, which um, You've Got Mail. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, oh, yeah. and yeah. interestingly enough, that's really what was happening to the mom and pop stores when that movie came right. out. Well, so. you know, a, another spin on that of what's happening with um, traditional publishers is as recently as a couple of years ago, a book that was digitally printed was disdained. It was looked oh, upon absolutely. as not being a real book. And then quietly, the larger publishers started doing their smaller titles in print-on-demand, but they did not publicize that, and they still continued to say, oh, well, you know, PODs, those aren't real books. And right, now, right. so many of the, tri- of the larger publishers' books that, as I say, are the smaller market, are being produced that same way. And, of course, e-books, well, they weren't real books at all. No, exactly. Yeah. And so that, that changing um, profile for publishing is one of the things that's putting the bookstores into problems and the publishers. Well, I think the iPad changed the whole history of e-books, that and Kindle. I mean, without a doubt, they created you know, the market was there after that. No one wanted to carry around on a hardback when you could have a whole volume of books to carry with oh, you Oh, right, plane. absolutely. Well, I carry them around on my phone now. No, absolutely, yeah. Uh, in the past, if a manuscript was rejected, it usually sat unread in a writer's desk drawer because of the al- alternative, self-publishing one's book. And that carried a stigma. You remember when no one really self-published. If you were a right. self-publisher, it was like, oh, well, that's because you couldn't get published by a major yeah, exactly. publisher. Exactly. Um, a writer would pay a vanity press to print the book, but stores rarely stocked them, and critics rarely reviewed them. And one of the reasons for this as well, that the self-publishers were, were, were uh, mocked, I guess you'd say, is the fact that you had to have a distributor. And this, it, it, you almost just couldn't self-publish oh, yeah. because the distributors would distribute the books. I, I'll tell you a, a real short story what happened to a friend of mine. She wrote a book. She was going to be on Maury Povich. Um, she had got her book to a distributor. She went on the show and thinking because the distributor had the books that the books was in the stores. So she had nationwide publicity. She did the, the show. And she had uh, – this was at a time when you didn't have the ebooks like you're talking about. So she had over a million hits on her website. And then when she called to find out oh, – and then she found out a week later they shipped the books. Well, what happens is when you go and do publicity for, you know, for your book, people are going to be listening to that title, and they're going to go to the bookstore the next day or if not the next day, the day after that or the day after that. But after a week, they're not going to ask about your book anymore. And until that book is in the stores, the bookstores don't even know it exists. Or at least that's the way it used to be. Well, then when she found out that happened, now the books are there. They're on the shelves. Well, it used to be if your books sat on the shelves for more than three months, the bookstore shipped them back. And when they ship them back, they rip off the cover. Right. So now they cannot be redistributed. So you've lost all of that. So that's exactly what happened to her. Now she's, she goes on Howard Stern. <laughs> her book was the brothel Bible, by the way. And she goes on Howard Stern. And again, millions of hits on her website. And she's calling a distributor to find out. And then she found out they had sent the books back before she went on Howard no, Stern. Uh, oh, no. So there's a valuable lesson there that you know when you do your publicity for anything you're doing, make sure you have that book readily available. Now you have the e-book, so it's not you know that difficult. But Yeah, but oh my God, what a disaster. Oh, it was a huge <laughs> disaster. And you know, the thing is, is the woman was doing very well with sales, you know, in, in the local stores, you know, where she had hands-on distrib- distribution. But that, w- that was really a sad story. <laughs> I, I'm going to go into a little bit about um, a commercial or trade publisher. Um, a ter- commercial or trade publisher purchases the right to publish a manuscript, usually together with other rights known as subsidiary rights. Uh, most pay in advance on royalties. Uh, commercial publishers are highly selective, publishing only a tiny percentage of manuscripts submitted. They handle every aspect of editing, publication, distribution, and marketing. They are no cost to the author. The author, in, in turn, return gets royalty checks. Now, this is kind of what you're doing, right, Oksana? Yes, in that, that yeah. is exactly. So you'll get a royalty based mm-hmm. on sales. 
and after you, you earn out your advance. Right, right. Of course, if you sell for foreign rights, then you, you can earn out your advance triple and quadruple times. Exactly. Now, Morgan, you and I were talking about this earlier, um, about how there's an advantage and disadvantage to having a um, commercial publisher. It depends on the book, really. Right, and and it depends on what you want it to do for you and how you envision your market, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, like my mystery books, um, they're all through traditional publishers. Mm -hmm. And same situation, advance, earn out the advance, get the royalties, go buy an ice cream cone. <laughs> 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 but um, no, they're, they're all with traditional publishers. Um, when I had a book that was a back-of-the-house book, by self-publishing it, I make a much greater amount on every book that's sold. And yes, I had upfront costs, but that earns out pretty quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have that, what's called a platform, and the platform is the following or the market that you've built of people who will buy your books. And if you have a specific platform and you self-publish, then when you're selling books after a, a presentation, you're making a lot more per every book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, of course, the other thing is if you need the book quickly. Or um, I might add one other thing is if I were self-publishing a book, I would only do it with a book that I wrote myself. I write with a lot of co-authors, too. And I, I think my epitaph will say she wrote well with others. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, the thing is, I know myself I'm an A-type. And if I did a self-published book with a co-author, I'd be doing about 90% of the work. Well, I think what we, we talked about this as well. There is a place for, obviously, the commercial publisher in that they take the hardest part of it out of your hands. You've written the book. They do your promotions for you. They, they do all the editing. You know, they really take a lot. Now, you are getting a royalty check as opposed to like you're talking about, you know, instead of earning right. 30 or 40%. Commission. But they also absorb the returns. But, they re right. but and also, that's the you know, as a self-published author, most self-published authors will never earn out what they paid for their Most self-published authors sell less than a thousand copies of their book. So they have to, you know, it's it's almost like a balance. Mm -hmm. um, there's There really isn't as much difference yeah. as people think bet between being traditionally published and self-published. It's exactly. just more difficult to be a traditionally published author. Um, but I think the success rate is is very similar in both. I th you you are right. Yeah. yeah, because even with we had this on the show as well that no matter whether you're you're published through a traditional house or self published, most authors sell less than a thousand books. It's it's the elite few at the top that sell millions. You know, exactly. and the the one, one advantage of a traditional publisher is that you also have that very important relationship with you know hopefully a great editor. Uh, which 99% of writers need. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes. So. I think one of the advantages as well with having a commercial house is the fact that they can open doors for you. Let's say oh, your absolutely. book were to be made into a movie. They do have those contacts. So well, they make those contacts for you. Or they make those contacts, contacts. right. They yeah. go so out and, and pitch your, your book absolutely. to as many people as they can. Um, I'm, our vanity or subsidiary publisher charges a fee to produce a book, yet still presents itself as a publisher. Uh, there's a wide variety of models for vanity and subsidiary publishing uh, from companies that do little more than produce a print run that's shipped to the author to companies that provide a menu of design, editing, distribution, and marketing service in addition to book production. Um, vanity presses or something like Ex Libra. Uh, it's just one that I can think of offhand. And they basically right. package the whole book for you. They do what you were talking about with the editing, but then they charge you a tremendous a fee. A right arm and a left Absolutely. leg. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the problem with what I have with subsidiary or vanity publishers is that it costs you so much for the book that when you go to sell it, you're paying already retail before you go out to sell it to someone else. So you have a hard time selling that book. Well, and with the uh, discounts that distributors demand, you basically have a horrible time there, you know, if it's a vanity. Uh, again, because of the costs of the books and, you know, the distributors take a huge chunk out. Right. And, and, and you know, I have a friend who spent a great deal of money getting his book done through a vanity press and um, 
they then came back and said, we can do a uh, thing for you for to sell to the movie industry. And they, and they charged a tremendous amount of money to put this package together you could have done on your own. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're there and they're, they're great for some people, but I think I would go the self-publishing yeah, on they my They load own. on all the other ancillary things too, like charging you, you know, three and four times the price for bookmarks, for business cards, for right. brochures, for all the different things. And, and you have to be careful of the quality. Because just because they're a vanity publisher doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. Now, print-on-demand is sort of along the line of self-publishing. Print-on-demand is is that you actually order a specific amount of books, or they'll often ship for you. Uh, You can find some print-on-demand companies that aren't as much as a lot of vanity presses or whatever, and you have a little more control. I think what's interesting is is that when you deal with either print-on-demand or vanity press, spe- specifically vanity press, is that you you lose control of your ISBNs because yes. you don't have your own. You know, you're not your own publisher. You know, someone's yeah. publishing for you. Can I add something in sure. on that? If Absolutely. somebody is going to self-publish and they want their own ISBN numbers the resource is Bokers B-O-W-K-E-R-S and it is very prudent to buy a blo- at least a block of 10 because you will pay $250 for a block of 10 whereas you'll pay about 125 or something for one right because and the way that works is like let's say you only need one or two now but you revise that book when you revise right. that book you have to have a new ISBN you also so. need different ISBN numbers for different versions of it True. if paperback, you do an audio hardback. book a an ebook um hardback paperback, paperback hardback mm-hmm. they all have different ISBN Correct. numbers yeah so um a true self publisher like vanity publishing requires the author to bear the entire cost uh, publication and also leaves marketing promotion to the author. However, rather than paying for preset packages services, the author puts those services together himself because every aspect of the process can be out to bid. Self-publishing can be much more cost-effective than vanis- vanity publishing. It can also result in higher quality product, which is true. You know, if, if you self-publish and you're smart enough, you can control every every phase of that. The book cover, the whole nine yards. I mean, if you get a graphic artist, you can say, I don't like this, I like that. So you really do have hands-on with everything that happens. Any comments on that? Um, yeah, I, I agree with that because when a lot of times when these vanity companies offer a package, they've got generic covers. Um, nine times out of ten, if you look at the cover, when it's up on Amazon or wherever it is, you go, oh, that's a, a self-published one because it's a cover that you've seen on yeah you can very easily other books. tell mm-hmm. yeah and the quality and, um also some of the setups and so forth and, and then they have the stepped up packages you know like um zir- zirconium right <laughs> up to diamond to platinum you know and and you look at the little things that you get for that bit of extra money and you're really not getting that much. I do need to mention that last show we talked about copyright, and I was telling everyone it's important to have your copyright. Yes. There are some publishing companies that 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 do not want you to get the copyright. And basically, I, when I say copyright, you're copywritten anyway once you've created the work. But registration is really what I'm getting at. Register your work with the right um, with the. Um, Library of Congress. Right. Um, but there are some agents that require a copyright, and there are some that do not. So you just need to know who you're dealing with and who you're targeting when you're out there. On um, last week's show, Kenneth called and asked about uh, iBook Author, and we mentioned that a while ago, how that's one of the apps for Mac on that you can take even Word documents and, and recreate those. We're at the last minute of the show, so on next week's show, I'm going to let you know that funding our project um, our, will be about funding your project and agents. Our panel will discuss the various ways to fund your project and offer advice on whether you should acquire an agent and if so, how. My guests will be authors Brian Yates and Kevin Parsons. I'd like to thank my guests Morgan St. James, Oksana Marfiotti, <laughs> Marfiotti and Anthony Anthony, are you there? Harakai. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can find links and information about all my guests on the Aspects of Writing website. Aspects of Writing broadcast live every Monday here on KLAV and on the Internet at www.klav1230am.com. Uh, future dates are also on Aspects of Writing. And remember, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing right here on KLAV.